Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Reading Graphic. I'm Sarah Hunter, Editor, Books for Youth and Graphic Novels at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click the Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we will pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Links to today's slides and title lists were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download these materials at any time by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Jennifer Chan, Director of Marketing at Fantagraphics Books, Amanda Acevedo, School and Library Marketing Manager at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Books for Young Readers, Taylor McBroom, School and Library Marketing Specialist at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Books for Young Readers, and Moni Barrett, Member at Large of the ALA's Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable. First, we'll hear from Jennifer Chan. Jennifer began her career working in bookstores after graduating from Boston University in 1997. Following her passion as a consummate reader and lover of art, comics, and graphic design, she moved into the publishing world in 2001 and has been working in trade sales and marketing for over 15 years. Jennifer is currently the Director of Marketing at Fantagraphics Books. Welcome, Jennifer. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Sarah. Hey everybody, thanks very much for listening in today. I'll be highlighting our lead titles from our winter 2021 list, as well as give special sneak previews of our new summer 2021 season. First up, I'll be presenting our newest books for younger readers. We have two new children's picture books on the summer list, The Penguin Cafe at the Edge of the World and Wake Up Sleepyhead. These are the next two in the Israeli picture book series that we've been publishing, which will complete the seven book collection. These are classic Israeli stories and poems translated into English and retold with modern panache by contemporary cartoonists. Penguin Cafe is a charming story that follows three penguin brothers who open up a restaurant at the South Pole. It features whimsical watercolors, with a vivid primary color palette and is a warm-hearted tale of friendship and collaboration. Wake Up Sleepyhead is a set of three silly stories about the struggles of kids waking up and getting out of bed. The amusing rhymes are perfectly paired with the hilarious and expressive illustrations. It's a funny and delightful read about kids trying to get through their daily routines. The collection as a whole are fun, enchanting, diverse stories for early readers and parents alike. They can be standalone books, as well as paired and bought together in any combination. These also work well as read-alouds and are great additions to any children's book section. Next is our middle grade graphic novel, Nobody Likes You, Greta Grump. Greta is a handful until her pet turtle, Nobody, teaches her to soften her ways. The two team up with her new friend, Gabby, to discover why the kind-hearted people of Friendly Town have turned so mean. Equal parts high-flying adventure and a deeply felt inquiry into the essential goodness of human nature. Greta Grump features tech whiz cats, gopher librarians, and gangs of squirrels in matching sweater vests. Kathy Mulcazian is one of the best cartoonists we publish. We have done four books in total. Her last book was an adult graphic novel called Eartha in 2017. This is her first children's book. She is an animator by trade and her stories take a very cinematic approach. All of her books contain stunning landscapes, beautiful depictions of nature, and there's a wonderful nuance to her characters too. She creates these great world building environments that showcase a sophisticated kind of storytelling. It's a fantasy fable with elements of magic realism. The warm-hearted allegory of this graphic novel makes it perfectly calibrated to the present moment when the need for us to look after one another is stronger than ever. 
in Michael Ross's YA graphic novel, The Thud, a developmentally impaired boy finds his world turned upside down after his mother has a stroke and he realizes for the first time he's on his own. This book has been selected as a Junior Library Guild gold standard selection. Noel is a boy who had always lived with his mother in Berlin until one day tragedy strikes and he finds himself alone for the first time. A man with a beard tells him he can't stay in the only home he's ever known. He has to move from his apartment and his city to some kind of care facility in a town he's never heard of. Noel is taken to a place with so many strangers. Who can he trust? Who can he love? There is a village in Germany called Neuarkoder that is largely populated and run by people with developmental disabilities. The local restaurant, the local bar, the local supermarket. It's a beautiful, even incredible place, and it's where the thud takes place. In 2016, Ross began visiting this village. Over the course of two years, he learned about the people who lived there and listened to their stories. Told from Noel's perspective with humor and empathy, the thud offers a rare window into the life of its developmentally disabled protagonist. In doing so, Ross has crafted an enchanting story that helps us understand the often misunderstood. Next up are our newest reprints of classic comic strips. Scoop Scuttle and His Pals is a rip-roaring retrospective of the influential Mad Magazine cartoonist, Basil Wolverton, whose often warped imagination combines with his outlandishly wacky visual humor to fascinate and delight. This book collects the ultra rare treasures Scoop Scuttle, Mystic Moot, Bing Bang Buster, and Jumpin' Jupiter. We also have two new Disney Masters volumes coming next summer. Volume 17 is the fourth book featuring Romano Scarpa. He's the Italian cartoonist who took over after Floyd Goffertson stopped creating new Mickey material in the mid 50s. Scarpa is a legend in his, his own right and we continue to reprint his very best. Volume 18 is the first volume to feature William Van Horn, another Disney fan favorite. Only his ducktail stories have been anthologized in modern times. By popular demand, this is the beginning of a comprehensive collection of Van Horn's Uncle Scrooge and Donald adventures. Up next is Darkwing Duck, Just Us Justice Ducks, which is the first book in a brand new Disney series. Disney published its own comics in-house throughout much of the 1990s including the famous Disney Adventures Digest, but also other magazines, including a Darkwing Duck limited series and related one-shot albums. These comics from Disney Adventures Magazine and its sister publications have been out of print and in demand by fans for years. Now they're back in a collector themed edition. The stories in our book come from all of these sources including the much demanded Disney adventure series, The Legend of the Chaos God, and an adaptation of the Goof Troop theatrical spin-off feature, A Goofy Movie, which has never been published in the US. We're also including an Adventures of the Gummy Bear story, The Legend of Tummy the Werebear, that was produced in the US, but never published here. So even readers who bought Disney's magazines in the 90s will discover, will discover some newer material that will be an exciting find for them. DuckTales is presently enjoying a new series on the Disney Channel and streaming on Disney Plus. So interest in the 80s and 90s original is high. And we're glad to be bringing back the classic material spun from it. Up next, I'll be highlighting our adult fiction and nonfiction titles. Monsters is the legendary project Barry Winter Smith has been working on for over 35 years, a 380 page tour de force of visual storytelling. Monsters narrative canvas is both fast and deep, part familial drama, part espionage thriller, part metaphysical journey. It is an intimate portrait of individuals struggling to reclaim their lives and an epic 
political odyssey across two generations of American history. Trauma, fate, conscience, and redemption are just a few of the themes that intersect in the most ambitious graphic novel of Windsor Smith's career. Alex and Carol, friends since childhood, are now literal partners in crime. But the heist to steal the painting, the Grand Odalisque from the Louvre is too much for the duo to handle. So they bring in Clarence, a bureaucrat son with a price on his head and more importantly, an arms dealer. And Sam, a stunt motorcyclist and boxer by trade who proves trigger happy with tranquilizer darts. Using soda can smoke bombs, rocket launchers and hang gliders, Alex, Carol, and Sam set off circumstances that result in a battle with the French special forces and their partnership, which was on the rocks, will never be the same again. In this formally inventive graphic memoir, Shira Spector, whose drawing is visceral, symbolic, and naturalistic, paints a vivid portrait of the most eventful 10 years of her life encompassing her tenacious struggle to get pregnant, the emotional turmoil of her father's cancer diagnosis and eventual death, and her recollections of past relationships with her parents and her partner. Set in a kaleidoscope of Montreal and Toronto, Red Rock Baby Candy begins in subtle tonal shades of black ink and introduces color slowly over the next 50 pages until it explodes into a glorious full color palette. The visual storytelling eschews traditional comics panels in favor of a series of unique page compositions that convey both a stream of consciousness and the tactile reality of life, both the subjective impressions of the author at each moment of the life she depicts and the objective series of events that shape her narrative. Stone Fruit is the exhilarating and tender debut graphic novel by Lee Lai, one of the most exciting new voices to break into the comics medium. Braun and Ray are a queer couple who enjoy their role as the fun weirdo aunties to Ray's niece, six-year-old Nessie. Their play dates are little oases of wildness, joy, and ease in all three of their lives, which ping pong between familial tensions and deep-seated personal stumbling blocks. As their emotional, sorry, as their emotional intimacy erodes, Ray and Braun isolate from each other and attempt to repair their broken family ties. Ray with her overworked, resentful single mother sister and Braun with her religious teenage sister who doesn't fully grasp the complexities of gender identity. Taking a leap of faith, each opens up and learns they have more in common with their siblings than they ever knew. What is great about this book is Lai's imaginative depictions of how complicated life is and how there are no easy answers. The story reflects life and life's mysterious forces. Lai knows how to use the language of comics and tells this story in such a compelling and truthful way that you can't help but accept the fate of these characters. Although this is her first full length book, her use of the medium is remarkably assured from the writing to the drawing to the pacing. She's able to depict the hardest of things the inner lives of her characters. And she has created one of the truly sophisticated graphic novel debuts in recent memory. In March, 2020, as the planet began to enter lockdown, acclaimed cartoonist, Simon Hanselman, decided that what the world needed most was free, easily accessible entertainment. So he set out to make the greatest web comic ever created. The result is also certain to be one of the most acclaimed and eagerly anticipated graphic novels of 2021. As the COVID-19 pandemic continued to escalate far beyond any reasonable expectations, Crisis Zone escalated right alongside. 
in real time with daily posts on Instagram. This book catalogs the adventures of Meg, Mog, Owl, and all of Hanselman's trademark characters as they escape the challenges and absurdities of the present moment. From the Black Lives Matter protests to Seattle's autonomous zone, the Tiger King, the release of Nintendo's Animal Crossing New Horizons for the Switch, as well as the pandemic itself. Crisis Zone engages with all this material with Hanselman's usual balance of humor, relatability, and nausea. The book will feature a number of cartooning innovations that marry the form of Instagram comics with high quality conventional comics, conventional comics, while also pushing the envelope of humor. Over the course of 2020, Crisis Zone has amassed unprecedented amounts of new fans to the Megan Mog universe and is presented here unabridged and uncensored with a slew of added pages and seams, as well as an extensive director's commentary from Hanselman himself. Celestia is the new graphic novel from Italian cartoonist Manuele Fiore. It's his fourth long form graphic novel for us and is probably his most ambitious work to date. The Great Invasion originated from the sea. It moved north across the mainland. Many fled, while some took refuge on a small concrete island called Celestia, built over a thousand years ago. Now cut off from the mainland, Celestia has become an outpost for criminals and other misfits, as well as a refuge for a group of young telepaths who have somehow evolved over the course of this undetermined future. Events push two of them, Dora and Perot, to flee the island and set sail to the mainland. There they discover a world on the precipice of a metamorphosis, though also a world where adults are literally prisoners of their own fortresses, unintentionally preserving the old world at a time when a new generation could guide society towards a better humankind. We're very excited to be publishing this new book by Fior. This is an A-list combination of art and design and graphic storytelling. The book showcases his singular talents as a once in a generation visual artist and a deeply empathetic writer who uses science fiction to look to the future of humanity. Up next is the latest book by Tardy called Farewell Brindavon. Tardy is our best-selling French cartoonist and one of the defining cartoonists of his generation. His style is immediately recognizable and he still produces work out of his studio in Paris. He's created many graphic novels across a wide range of different genre styles. This book is his very first graphic novel. It was originally published in 1974 and it's the first time it will be published in English. It is an adventure story set in 1914. Wendavon is a photographer by trade, but is also the quintessential everyman character. He's visited by a mysterious old man out of the blue who tells him to go to Istanbul, but then is immediately murdered. Wendavon fulfills the old man's wish but assassins track him throughout the Middle East every step of the way. It's sort of a loose prequel to the Adele Blanc sex series, which we published a while ago. And in addition to the main story, there's a short piece after that follows Buendavon during World War I. So it has that classic tardy anti-war element to it. It's very cinematic and has this North by Northwest feel to it. It's a quick read at 64 pages and it's a great adventure story. It's probably one of the most wacky and fun Tardy stories to read. The other interesting thing to note as this is his first comic is just how many of his signature themes and ideas were so fully formed and established right from the beginning. So it'll be a great find for fans who already love Tardy as well as a great entry point for new readers. Have you ever awakened from a sleepy delirium one morning 
and imagined that you lived in a different and glorious world where all the recognized masterpieces in the Western pantheon of art history were painted by women? If not, no problem. The award-winning painter and illustrator, Anita Kuntz, has imagined it for you in her hilariously inventive and masterfully executed Another History of Art. Kuntz de depicts the most iconic paintings in art history as if they had been painted by women. Conceived with delicious wit, boundless humor, and an eye for the telling aesthetic detail, Kuntz's recreations are not only stunning paintings in their own right, but a sly revisionist social commentary on the male-dominated history of Western civilization. Included on each page opposite the painting is a single paragraph biography of each woman artist. The presentation is brilliantly satirical. It has a playful feminist slant to it without being didactic and makes its point through the graceful craft and the ingenuity of the painterly technique. The paintings themselves, quite apart from their political content, are beautiful and funny. Another History is a fantastic counterfactual history of art conceived, written, and painted by one of our most accomplished contemporary artist illustrators. Okay, well, that's it for me. Thanks again to all who registered and for tuning in. All the titles in my presentation are available on Edelweiss. Please feel free to contact me if you want to join our catalog mail list or with any review copy requests or questions you may have. I also send out newsletters for both our adult and our children's titles. So please get in touch if you'd like to sign up and be sure to check out um, and follow us on social media as well. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. Next, we'll hear from Amanda Acevedo and Taylor McBroom. Amanda is the School and Library Marketing Manager for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Books for Young Readers. After moving to Boston in 2011 to obtain her master's degree in publishing from Emerson College, she was hired at HMH and has been talking about their wonderful books ever since. Taylor is a School and Library Marketing Specialist for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Books for Young Readers. She got her start in picture book marketing and is always happy to talk about her favorite picks for little ones. She loves working with books for all ages at HMH. Take it away, Amanda and Taylor. Hi, everyone. I'm just Amanda. Taylor and I are excited to share about our new graphic novel line for readers of all ages, uh, young readers, <laughs> no adult books here, uh, Etch. This new imprint just started in the fall. So today we'll introduce our launch list and our follow-up list coming this spring. Sherlock Bones. Introducing Sherlock Bones in a fun new action-packed graphic novel mystery series, perfect for dinosaur loving emerging readers. In book one, Sherlock Bones and his sidekick, a stuffed parrot named Watts, live in a natural history museum. Sherlock Bones knows he is the greatest detective in the whole museum. So when the precious royal blue diamond goes missing, he and Watts are the first on the case. What they don't expect is Grace, a silly new to the scene raccoon who keeps getting in the way. Even worse, Bones and Watts learn that if the diamond isn't recovered, the museum could close. Can they find the diamond before they're forced to find another home? In book two, coming next spring, the museum has added an exciting new exhibit, Reef to Shore. When Sherlock overhears that a swamp monster has been sighted, he gathers his team to investigate. At first, Sherlock Bones suspects Niblack, a quirky octopus with a talent for camouflage. But then Bones and team find a horrifying long-haired green beast. Can they escape the creature or is it too late for our beloved frog mouse skeleton and his ragtag mystery solving team? Dino Mighty by Greg Trine, writing as Doug Paleo, illustrated by Aaron Bletcha. On their own, they are four mild-mannered dinos, Terry Dactyl, a motivated and resilient go-getter, Dave, who loves pizza, video games, and pumping iron, t who loves to give awkward hugs, and Buck, 
one smart chicken. Together, these friends are dino mighty, ready to solve crimes and keep everyone safe. Everything is pleasant and good in Dino Town until Terry Dactyl is sent a cryptic email that says the precious golden egglets are in danger. Dino Mighties unite, but can they spray into action fast enough to save these valuable jewels from evil baddies? Readers of Dogman, Hilo, and the Bad Guys will love the outrageous and zany humor paired with the action-packed adventure in this exciting new graphic novel series. Timo the Adventurer by Jonathan Garnier, illustrated Johan Sacre. Having read every book in his tiny village, young Timo decides it's time to leave home and become a hero. And while that's easier said than done, Timo is determined to succeed. He makes discoveries, explores creepy caverns, and then rescues an enchanted beast named Bruf, gaining a gruff and reluctant ally. But little does good-hearted Timo suspect that Bruce's mysterious past will bring complications to his journey. Is Bruce actually a friend, or will he end up being a foe instead? An engaging hero, surprising plot twists, and a host of fantastical creatures will keep readers turning the page of this spellbinding fantasy. Chasing Paper Caper and the Need for Speed Caper this full cover graphic novel based on the Netflix series starring Gina Rodriguez introduces kids to geography, culture, and history. Take in all the action, adventure, and excitement of India with Carmen Sandiego, the world's greatest thief. Where in the world is Carmen Sandiego? In Chasing Paper Caper, she's headed to Mumbai, India for her next adventure. It's up to Carmen and her crew to stop the criminal masterminds vile from their evil exploits. What is vile actually after? Can Carmen find out and stop them in time? And in the need for speed caper, Carmen is headed to Dubai. Carmen and her crew must stop vile from stealing a high speed supercar to use for their evil exploits. But when an old rivalry gets in the way, can Carmen and the gang make a new plan before it's too late? High speeds and high stakes await in the city of gold. Nose Place for Monsters by Corey Merritt isn't a traditional graphic novel, but it's just so cool and highly illustrated that we couldn't resist sharing it with you today. Nothing ever seems out of place in the safe suburban town of Cowslip Grove. Lawns are neatly mowed, sidewalks are tidy, and the sounds of ice cream trucks fill the air. Well, that is an ice cream truck, right? But because now kids have been going missing, except no one even realizes it because no one remembers them. Not their friends, not their teachers, not even their families. But our heroes, if they can find their courage, Levi and Kat do remember, and suddenly only they can see why everyone is in terrible danger when the night air rolls in. Now it's up to Levi and Kat to fight and save the missing kids before, they, before it swallows the town whole, if they can get along long enough to do it. In this spellbinding, lavishly illustrated story that Diary of a Wimpy Kid author Jeff Kinney calls wildly imaginative and totally terrifying, two unlikely friends face down their worst fears in order to stop their small town and themselves from disappearing for good. Ichiro by Ryan and Zana. Re-releasing with Etch, this graphic novel was an Eisner nominee and an Asian Pacific American young adult honor book. Raised by his Japanese mother, Ichiro idolizes his dead American father and struggles to fit in. When his mother decides to visit Japan, Ichiro is left there with his grandfather in a country he doesn't know. Grandfather becomes Ichi's guide, sharing Japan with him. But one night, a monster drives Ichi away into the domain of the gods. Now he must face his fears and learn about the nature of man, of gods, and of war. He also learns that there are no easy answers for gods or men. Called thought-provoking, wholly original, and captivating by reviewers, Ichiro asks hard questions for readers but challenges them to arrive at their own conclusions, book list, and offers a powerful commentary on war and peace bulletin. Over to Taylor. 
Hi everyone, this is Taylor and I'm going to talk about a few of our titles that are in on our spring list. First is Oh My God by Stephanie Cook and Indra Fitzpatrick illustrated by Juliana Moon. Oh My God reads as if Raina Talgemeier and Rick Riordan teamed up to write a comic and offers a fresh and funny spin on Greek mythology. Karen is just an average 13-year-old from New Jersey who loves to play video games with her friends and watch movies with her mom. But when she moves to Greece to live with her mysterious father, Zed, suddenly everything she thought about herself is up in the air. Starting a new school can be difficult, but starting school at Mount Olympus Junior High, where students are gods and goddesses, just might take the cake. Especially when fellow classmates start getting turned to stone. Greek mythology, a little less myth, a little more eek. And if Karen's classmates are immortal beings, who, who does that make her? So that Ghosted is another book that isn't technically a graphic novel, but it's also heavily illustrated and it's from the best-selling author of the How to Be a Supervillain series, Michael Fry. Larry's got a few problems. In school, he's one of those kids who easily gets lost in the crowd, and Grim, Larry's best friend in the whole world, has ghosted him, literally. One minute, Grim was saving a cat in a tree during a lightning storm, and the next, he's pulling pranks on Larry in his new ghostly form. When the two best friends realize that there's something keeping Grimm tethered to their world, they decide that finishing their totally to-do bucket list is the perfect way to help Grimm with his unfinished business. Pulling hilarious pranks and shenanigans may be easier with a ghostly best friend, but as Larry and Grimm brave the, scars of <laughs> brave the scares of seventh grade, they realize that saying goodbye might just be the scariest part of middle school. Power Up by Sam Neeson, illustrated by Darnell Johnson. This inventive graphic novel that unfolds online and IRL takes readers from the halls of middle school to epic robot video game battles and back again. It's a perfect pick for reluctant readers who are also video game fans. Miles and Reese know each other only as Griffin and Backslash, and in the video game Mecha Melee, they're an unstoppable team. They're the best friends they've got online or in the real world, and they don't even realize they go to the same middle school. But real life wrongdoing blasts their duo into a crater the size of Arcticon. With life online and, and off a complete mess in Battlecon, the every game ever tournament just weeks away, can the boys play their way back to each other? Before They Were Artists by Elizabeth Heidel. This vibrantly illustrated graphic novel anthology brings to life the childhood experiences of beloved artists and illustrators such as Wanda Gogg, Maurice Sendak, and Jerry Pinkney. Stylish illustrations paired with small vignettes and anecdotes from the artists' early lives help illuminate the hard work, triumphs, failures, and inspiration that helps forge their successful careers. Children will see themselves in these portraits and wonder if they too might have it in them to make art. A celebration of creativity, this collective graphic biography is sprinkled throughout with writing wisdom and inspiring quotes. Look for the companion book before they were authors, famous writers as kids as well. Clash by Kayla Miller. Kayla Miller, the New York Times bestselling author illustrator of Click, Camp, and Act, returns with the next chapter of Olive's story, tackling new friendships, middle school conflicts, and the importance of empathy. There's a new kid in town. From the moment Natasha sets foot in class, it's clear she's one of the coolest kids in sixth grade. Everyone wants to be her friend, including Olive, but things might not be so easy. Olive tries her best to, to befriend Nat, but it seems like the only thing they have in common is that they both want to hang out with Olive's friends. Watching as Natasha gets closer with some of her best buds, Olive can't help but worry that they're starting to like Nat more than they like her. And who could blame them? Nat is just that cool, and Olive is, well, just Olive. 
As with the other books in Olive's story, Kayla Miller delivers a nuanced look at navigating middle school friendships and the importance of both empathy and respect. Pear Northern by Stephanie Cook, illustrated by Mari Costa. So I know Halloween just passed this year, but trust me when I say you don't want to miss this title for next Halloween. It's the perfect fall read that's not too spooky for younger readers. It's fall break in the supernatural town of North Haven, and young witch Abby's plans include pitching in at her mom's magical coffee shop, practicing her potion making, and playing board games with her best friends, a pumpkin head, a wolf girl, and a ghost. But when Abby finds her younger sister being picked on by some speed demons, she lets out a burst of magic so strong it opens a portal to a realm of chaos bunnies. And while these bunnies may look cute, they're about to bring the apocalypse and get, in, and get Abby in a hot cauldron full of trouble unless she figures out a way to reverse the powerful magic she unwittingly released. What's a witch to do? In this deliciously humorous, cozy, and bewitching graphic novel, sometimes the most uh, powerful magic comes from our connections to family and friends, but kicking bunny butt is great too. And then on the next slide, we have our social media channels as well as our resources site and our emails if you have any questions. Um, we don't have advanced copies of all of these titles, but the ones we do have are available on Edelweiss and Kelly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amanda and Taylor. Our final panelist today will be Moni Barrett. Moni is a member at large for the American Library Association's Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable and co-founder of the nonprofit Creators Assemble Inc., which is dedicated to promoting literacy through the use of comics in classrooms and libraries and guiding career pathways for aspiring creators. She has recently expanded her expertise in libraries, comics, and relationship building through her role at Comics Plus for Library Pass as the Director of Content Management and Publisher Relations, where she helps classrooms and libraries maximize access to educational comics and graphic novel content. As a former public library manager, Moni won the California Library Association's PR Excellence Award in 2018 and 2019 for library events aimed at underserved adult library users and has proven success with using comics to increase library circulation. She is a frequent panelist at San Diego and New York Comic Con. I've seen her personally, she's great. Uh, San Diego Comics Fest and WonderCon, hosting industry networking events and providing instruction to educators and librarians. Take it away, Moni. Thank you so much. And um, if you could advance one more, this slide has a weird twofer here. As we mentioned, I am Moni Barrett, current member at large for the Comics Graphic Novel Roundtable of the American Library Association. And thank you so much for being here to kind of hear the history of comics librarianship and the GNCRT. So today we are known as the newest and fastest growing roundtable of the American Library Association. You can go ahead and hit the next slide there. Um, at least 25% of our membership is comprised of students, which is important to note because we become kind of the first point of professional contact, both to librarianship and to um, ALA as a whole. And we take that very seriously and are very responsive to our students. We also have a words and reading list that influence comics and graphic novel publishing. And other things that we do include advocating for and promoting comics and graphic novels developing programming and creating pop-up libraries at comic cons and library conferences we administer the will eisner graphic novel grants for libraries we provide networking opportunities for library staff and educators involved with graphic novels and comics we curate and create resources for collection development and best practices and programming we create outreach opportunities to grow membership and allow more access to our resources and we discuss and advocate for issues around cataloging, cataloging and metadata as it relates to comics. But it wasn't always this way. And as a matter of fact, um, if you go ahead, 1974, uh, Will Eisner actually did an article with an illustration for School Library Journal, arguing for comics in the, li in the library, to no avail really at the time. 1990 Comics Librarianship, we have here a, a handbook by Randall W. Scott. This copy is held in the ALA archives in Chicago. 
The first volume was written on comics librarianship and Scott predicted a widening of the field in the next 10 years and that comic, comics librarianship would, would spread across all fields. However, this did not happen. In 2003, we have this uh, rise of the graphic novel faster than a speeding bullet hardcover, which was finally some progress, uh, which was attributed, according to Will Eisner, to the work that librarians were doing in the space. So moving on to the graphic novel pavili pavilion at ALA Annual. Go ahead and click forward for me there, thank you. Uh, we started in 2004 with 13 comics publishers. The graphic novel stage was added in 2010, and Artist Alley was added in 2011. In 2018, there were more than 20 exhibitors in the graphic novel pavilion, plus graphic novel publishers and distributors spread across the exhibit floor, 18 graphic novel stage sessions, three book buzz talks about comics, eight sessions focused on graphic novels, including a two half-day pre-conferences, and the GNCRT was ratified by the ALA Council. So a little history on that. The roundtable initially was a grassroots member interest group started by ALA members in 2011. And this group grew through taking on these projects that we talked about at comic conventions and then the administering of the Eisner grants and doing more, doing more program development for annual. So talking about some breakthroughs in our space, in 20, 2006 and 2007, some breakthrough years included, not everything, but just some highlights. Jean Yang's American Born Chinese was the first graphic novel to win one of the Youth Media Awards, the Prince Award. Also in 2006 and 2007, you also started their great graphic novel list. And shortly after in 2009, the Texas Library Association started their Maverick graphic novels and comics list. And then moving forward in 2009, the library presence started in cons. The initial one uh, at Comic Cons consisted of librarian networking opportunities, such as this epic librarian photo shoot, which took place at C2E2. And ALA has had a presence, some presence at C2E2 for 10 years. In 2016 and 17, Jean Yang became the national ambassador for young people's literature which was the first uh, graphic novelist. And in 2017, March wins everything. <laughs> the uh, National Book Award, which was the first comic to win, the Coretta Scott King and the Siebert, et cetera, and was adopted into school curriculums all over the country. 2018 and 2019, comics break through to mainstream in an undeniable way. Again, just these are just some highlights to include Raina Talgemeyer's overwhelming success over the past 10 years um, for her two books and each had initial 1 million print runs, that's Guts and Share Your Smile. Obviously the Marvel movies and franchise uh, started to push demand and library checkouts. Um, easy readers, Marvel everything. The top, uh, of the top 10 movies of that year, four were Marvel. And then the huge success of Into the Spider-Verse and just a note that Black Panther was the highest grossing film of 2018 and is among the top grossing films of all time. And more compelling business case examples include Dave Pilkey's title, Lord of the Fleas, which started with an initial 5 million print run. And this is kind of where I come into things. I was invited here um, as someone who has experience getting comics and graphic novels into people's hands and into libraries. Uh, if you can go ahead and advance the slide there. There we go, thank you. So in 2015, um, I started at Escondido Public Library in San Diego County, and uh, kids and teens comics were flying off the shelves, but uh, there was a lot of mature content in the teen area, and adults were having to feel kind of weird going over into the teen area to get their books. And I convinced my admin at the time to let me move uh, comic strips out of the cartoon area, collect everything we had in the library, put them in one location, which was adult graphic novels, uh, and to uh, allow me to spend $200. So with this small amount of money and with what I could find around the library, I ended up with some nonfiction, memoirs, graphic medicine, and indie titles alongside the comic strips and a couple of superheroes, and we could not keep them on the shelves. The shelves were embarrassingly empty within the first, I'd say, two days. 
So within six months, I had a legitimate case for more funding that turned it in this collection into the third highest checkout collection in the library. And from there, in addition to growing these statistics, so we're on the next one, um, I began to illustrate the importance of supporting the collection with programming. Uh, Escondido Library added a read an adult graphic novel to the annual summer reading challenge for adults. And you can see that there were summer spikes in July of each year. And this turned summer reading traditional into being something that was just for the kids into now being something that was also for the adults to enjoy. Um, there was permanent growth trend after the start of the Adult Graphic Novel Book Club in October, which was by far their most popular program. It actually led to a second no graphic novel book club uh, for ages 18 to 40 in the library. That program is sponsored by San Diego Comic-Con and it brought a whole new younger adult demographic to the library. And as mentioned in my bio, I began paneling at WonderCon, Comic-Con, and New York Comic-Con, um, not only on how and why libraries should use comics and graphic novels, but also advocating specifically for adult comics librarianship, since there was now de demonstrated success. And as we saw, the kids' comics and teens' comics are so tried and true and so great in growing this market. In 2018, I was on the One Book, One San Diego panel of judges that brought Congressman Lewis's civil rights biography march to San Diego through KPBS. And that was our display, much challenged fan book display that we did there. So that, that brings me into the graphic novel and comics roundtable again, which you can see the press here on June 25th of 2018, we reached official status as a roundtable and not just a grassroots interest group. Uh, June of 20, June 27th of 2018, and we were getting a lot of good press. It's actually the next slide. Um, and that's our picture of our first board there as well. Graphic novel novels shine in a very different Hall H. And this is from Comics Beat. As one article points out in the library market where a single award can mean over 50,000 copies of a books will be purchased. This is a huge validation of the graphic novel category and we'll see many effects rolling out in the coming years. And indeed, it's, it's as we've talked about, it's influenced publishing and all the other great things that these folks have talked about here today. So where to find us now? We do panels and programming. We have presence even virtually at cons, including C2E2, NYCC, SDCC, Emerald City, WonderCon, TCAF, and SPX. If you check out hashtag LibPopUp, you'll see more really fun pictures of some of the events we've done in the past. We can daydream about being able to go places. And where we are now also, the Eisner Graphic Novel Grants. So Eisner Grant offers three grants and was just expanded in 2018 to 2019 year to include libraries in Mexico and in Canada. It is the largest graphic novel grant available to schools and libraries and one of the largest grants throughout all of librarianship. There have been 10 recipients in five years have included very rural libraries that were 100 miles from their nearest comic shop, a school library in Charleston, South Carolina that serves incarcerated youth, a library at Colorado State University whose project was focused on serving and working with local veteran groups. So this has really expanded and done some wonderful things across the country. Where we all now are now also, our toolkit offers collection development, reader's advisory, and advocacy, and it's three of the biggest requests that we have for webinars and content creation. Also, our outreach projects section of the website offers online reader, reader's advisory, uh, one of the, which is called Book Match, which is really fun. You can do it virtually as well. You can ask us, I like these types of things, and we'll tell you what comic would match with that. And also creators get carded for library card sign up month, which offers some great visibility, um, having some higher profile creators come in and advocate for libraries. Everything is available on the website, ala.org slash RT slash GNCRT. Our social media communities are very active, um, including Twitter, Instagram. You can use the hashtag libcomics with an X or at libcomics for Instagram and Twitter. 
or you can find us virtually in articles and webinars. I'd recommend our YouTube page. Um, our playlist has some really good content on there, especially the Band Books Week stuff. It's very inspiring and fun. Or someday uh, back at local com cons, once we have a post-pandemic era, you will see us there again. And uh, again, some resources. I was asked to kind of share some up-to-date resources of where you might find support for use of comics and graphic novels. So as I mentioned, um, GNCRT at LibComics. You can kind of just shoot us questions there. But some other resources, if you haven't heard of them before, include No Flying, No Tights, which uh, has comics reviews for all ages that you can trust. Um, these last two, just to clarify, I am affiliated with them, but I still believe in them very much. Um, Creators Assemble is developing a digital quick start toolkit, which is a guide for using comics in libraries and classrooms. And it comes with free 24 seven support for teachers and librarians. And you don't even have to have the toolkit to get the support. Look us up creatorsassemble.org. And also Comics Plus for Library Pass at comicsplusapp.com. What's special about them versus other digital comics providers is the unlimited simultaneous use model um, and the support of graphic novels and, and comics for schools specifically. We are developing resources to help in classrooms and um, the simultaneous use would be something like your entire book club or that one book one San Diego project with March, the entire you know district can read it all at the same time. It's, it's pretty amazing. There's no waiting. So that's pretty much it for me. Feel free to contact me with any questions. I can be most easily reached at Moni at creatorsassemble.org. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Moni. So we have a little bit of time for additional questions today. So if anybody in the audience would like to submit questions in the Q&A, we will uh, make some selections and post them to the panelists. Um, I'd like to start with a question inspired by a comment in the Q&A. Uh, Moni, this is specifically for you. Uh, we got a comment about um, making a case essentially for uh, holding a comic con at a library. Do you have any advice for librarians who might um, need help convincing their library administration to hold a comic con style event at their library? Absolutely. Um, actually, that's one of the things that I cover in my um, talks as I've, as I've gone across the country with these talks is how to talk to stakeholders and talk to your administration to advocate for these things. Um, I can provide some resources if you want to reach out to me. Um, the toolkit also, again, you don't have to purchase it to get it, but we are providing a free like infographic with kind of how to talk to stakeholders, which just has um, some good statistics and validation for why you should do these things. Excellent. Um, there's another question in here about awards and reading lists. And I wonder, um, Moni, again, this is for you. Sorry to the other panelists, but <laughs> a lot of the questions about this. Um, I know you have a lot of uh, awards and reading lists. Do you want to talk about the um, adult reading list that you're working on in the roundtable right now? Sure. The adult reading list, we kind of prioritize that to come out because, again, that content does exist for children's and for teens, which is fantastic. But we thought that we would make a bigger splash for the adult reading list to come out sooner. Um, and I think you can still get involved with it. It may be done with the voting. But again, GNCRT, uh, ALA dot slash RT slash GNCRT, you should be able to find that. I also see how does one apply to join GNCRT. You do have to be an ALA member, but it's one of the add-ons as you go through. And there's a lot of different levels of membership. Um, so if you're unemployed or if you're a student, there's a lot lower rates. And then the round table will only be a few dollars on top of that. Um, this next question, I think I'm going to post to the whole uh, panel here. Um, how do you handle uh, censorship of graphic novels is the question. And I guess if we could open this up a little bit more widely, um, how do you approach nudity in graphic novels? I think this is something that we are probably all thinking about, especially in libraries. Um, do you uh, alert librarians about nudity in graphic novels? Like what are some of the principles that you use when um, assigning grade ranges, recommending books at libraries when it comes to things uh, like nudity in graphic novels? Um, and let's see, um, 
Jennifer, could we start with you? Because your presentation definitely <laughs> yeah, has sure. some nipples in it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, for us, for Fantagraphics, we are prim primarily an adult publisher. And, um, you know, so we publish uh, mostly adult titles. And, um, but we do have um, some, some books for younger readers as well. Um, for us, you know, we, we've been doing it for, for quite a long time, since the mid 70s. And, um, you know, we um, have uh, uh, just worked really hard to get as much content out there as possible. Um, so that way, you know, people know exactly, um, you know, what the books are about. Um, if there is um, any um, uh, nudity or um, uh, uh, content like that, um, that might not be appropriate for, for, um, for, younger, for younger readers. Um, we're pretty, you know, um, upfront about um, what uh, the books that we publish and the content that's inside. So we try to make as much, um, you know, content and resources available um, as early on, um, as soon as the, the books are announced. So there's a lot of content um, on Edelweiss and uh, we make uh, galleys um, and previews available. Yeah, so nobody should be surprised exactly. by a book that they pick up from you. Like it should be pretty obvious um, right off the bat. And then Moni, I'd like to sort of turn it back on you. Do you have any advice for librarians who might be facing um, book challenges for titles that do have nudity in them in graphic novels? Sure. Um, in my time in librarianship and also actually Comics Plus, we address this quite a bit because we work with both the school libraries and the public libraries and the standards can be kind of different. Um, for starters, good cataloging and good metadata to make sure, whether it's digital or physical, that things are in appropriate places. So again, you have them in your teens, and in which case, what level of nudity do you think your threshold is in your community? You have to kind of know your community and how, um, how conservative they might be about those things. And if you're in a public library, and if you're in a school library, of course, you know your age groups and what, what the parents and, and the teachers and the administration decides. Um, at Comics Plus, we have a pretty clear aging process where we basically go with, if it's nudity as in human nudity and that kind of thing, it can be in the older teens and we do actually define what's in that content. And then if it's nudity like, you know, gratuitous, I wouldn't say gratuitous because I don't like to censor things, but if it's sex and that kind of thing, that might go into the all ages 18 plus category. So I think just being really clear with what content you're talking about and making sure that it's in the right place consistently and having a process for that is really, really helpful. And then of course, having conversations with people. I mean, even my March display, I got a lot of backlash and, and banning and that kind of thing on it. And I would recommend you go to the GNCRT's YouTube channel as well, because in our banned books, we talk about handle, in our banned book webinars, we talk about handling challenges. Great, thank you so much. Um, we are just about out of time here. Um, so I think we're gonna wrap up if that's all right with everybody. Um, I wanna say thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, you did a wonderful informative job of letting us know about your upcoming titles and uh, excellent resources available for librarians. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. If you haven't already, be sure to check out Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors post daily about all things books and library land. Not yet a subscriber? Pair the page-by-page -page reading experience of print with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of the special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. And one more thank you to our sponsors, Fantagraphics Books, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Books for Young Readers, and the Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable. This concludes today's webinar.